Welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Fashion Masters podcast. My name is Quinn Castling. I'm the VP of Block Therapy. And of course, we have Deanna Hansen here, the founder of Block Therapy. And on last week's episode, we talked about inflammation and different kinds of inflammation. But I remember you mentioned the four stages of tissue freeze. And this is relevant to kind of understand inflammation, but to also understand injuries and kind of how we become more dense with our tissue and how we can actually reverse that process. So this is really interesting if anybody is what has chronic inflammation has an injury that may has or most likely hasn't healed properly or even an acute injury correct yeah awesome okay so we're going to dive in to the four stages of tissue freeze this is very very interesting because we're going to also mention how you can reverse that and that's what we want to do because even though we become frozen, dense, hard, inflamed, we can always reverse that process through fascia decompression. Exactly. And it's really neat because when you really understand these four stages and that you have the ability to move through these stages, we're, we're not trapped and locked into our demise of tissue freeze. So just to recap, so stage one is healthy tissue. It's a healthy, spacious body where there's essentially optimal flow to and from cells. So would that be defined as like perfect? It's like the perfect body kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, you know, none of us will ever likely be perfect where every one of our trillions of cells is in, in exact alignment. But the general healthy person that doesn't experience any issues in their body, like, okay. you know, this is sort of what we're looking at as a, a healthy body. So typically stage two happens when we have acute injury. So we have an acute injury. Let's just call it a sprained ankle for to make it simple. And... Again, this is really where we have the opportunity to change the direction from which we've previously been going with the way we treat injury. So we have this gap, and we talked last week about how the second law of thermodynamics is nature abhors a gradient, which means when there's a gap in the system, nature is going to fill it in. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that happens is inflammation because the body is directing flow to this area that suddenly has had an impact of some sort there's damage and it needs attention. So we want to support that. If we do support inflammation properly, that gap gets filled in through actually rebuilding the tissue. And if we allow that process to completion, what should happen is that tissue should be as it was before the injury. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, what does happen though, for the most part is we have been trained to limit inflammation for the first 48 to 72 hours through the Rice method, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. So when we do that, now that gap is still there, but we're not allowing that inflammation to rebuild. So what the body does is it's taking the netting, all of the, the fascia from the neighboring cells, and it's sucking it into this space. So essentially, it's squeezing the life out as it's taking the netting in and it mm. does it in a spiral fashion. Mm. So now let's say, okay, here's here's the here's the ligament of the ankle that's been torn. Mm -hmm. Now all of the tissue around it gets sucked in. So now the actual alignment of that ankle joint changes because if it gets filled in with the netting, which is essentially scar tissue, it doesn't have the elastic properties. It's basically lacking life. It's dense. And now we don't have a fluid joint like we did prior to that injury. So this is where it gets really interesting because in the body's mind, it's saying, okay, you know, this area hasn't been fully healed. Not only that, on the other side of this dam, the scar tissue, which is like a beaver dam, all of the cells on the other side also aren't getting properly fed and clean because now flow is limited. So the body's saying, well, wait a sec, all of these other cells aren't getting properly fed. So we're going to even direct more inflammation, more inflammation. And this is where it becomes really important to understand stage three, which is basically chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation, as we've mentioned, you know, is, is literally what they claim is the root of things like dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, like disease in the body. Yeah. It comes through this chronic inflammation. So between stage two and stage three, we have this really interesting opportunity to understand how to change the direction of the course that we were on to do something different than what we've been trained to do. 
because if healing is complete, there, there's no more need for inflammation. We've rebuilt it to the pre-injury site, mm -hmm. but that's not the typical response that we have. So now all of us, and, and the thing is too, we can heal that injury to the point where we say, okay, you know, I'm back to functioning. So my ankle's working, I can go back to playing sports and stuff, but we still have a change in that joint. So there's still going to be that low grade chronic inflammation because there's always going to be cells now in that space that haven't fully been rebuilt. So this is what the body understands. It's like, well, I still need to help it. I still need to help it because the body's always working to create that balance and, and you know, the homeostasis so that we can get back to optimal functioning. So this is what the body's doing. If that is left for a long period of time, then we go into stage four where there's so much inflammation and now adhesions and, and congestion and blockage that there's very little to, if any, flow getting to that tissue. So this is where, in my view, disease is really, you know, it's, it's time disease is going to set in and then there can be lots of problems because we know with lack of flow, there's stagnancy. So what's exciting about understanding this, stage four isn't tissue death, it's tissue freeze. So we have the opportunity to go from stage four to stage three, back to stage two, back to stage one, or even from stage two to stage three to stage two. Like we can move in and out through these four stages mm. by understanding how to, again, get energy and oxygen into these areas where it has been dense and frozen through the process of fascia decompression. So does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's do like a quick recap. So, so stage one, acute injury. No, that's stage two. So stage one is healthy. Sorry, stage one is healthy. Stage yeah. two is acute injury. Yeah. Stage three is... Chronic. So right, chronic stage two has not been completed, so it becomes chronic. Okay. Stage four is tissue freeze or like tissue hibernation. Yeah. Right. So then would you say that we would have to go... I know you kind of said we can kind of hop between, but it's more likely that we'd go from four, then to three, then to two, then to one. Yes, yeah, we, we got to go through the stages. So if, and that's the beautiful thing because we have people coming to us that have immune issues or cancers or, you know, other things, dementia, even just brain fog, memory loss, gut issues. This is all really a function of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So to be able to understand that and what we can do to turn on all of that potential energy that's in that frozen inflammation mm -hmm. and activate it to move back to those other stages totally. that aren't hibernation or frozen. They're like bears hibernating. Exactly. Yeah, and time to wake up kind of thing. So how does somebody know if they're at stage four? Like what is stage four as in like a physical view? So, okay, let's just talk about the difference between, say, arthritis and having a, the need for a knee replacement. Mm. That would be, in my view, the difference. So, again, we... So like, stage three would be the... Arthritis. Arthritis. Stage four would be, okay, you, like, we got to replace this. Yes, okay. exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you still believe if somebody needs a hip replacement, let's say, do you think it's possible that the body can go back over time, if they're doing the right things to its natural original state, or at least improve it so that they do not need a hip replacement? We've, we've had that, yes. I think there is a point of no return for some people where there's literally no cartilage left. And we've dealt with people like that where, you know, they, they get into block therapy because they want to try to prevent a replacement. Now, what's interesting is, and, and I've had some people actually like really go at it and really do the job so that they could actually try to prevent it. But um, for some, they haven't been able to prevent it. But what's fascinating is that their rate of healing is so much faster. And we've seen this a number of times in the community where they've ended up needing the replacement, but now you've put the space back into the tissue around the joint. So now when they go and they do a cut, now we've got healthy tissue. So that would be the difference, say, um, you know, stage one is healthy tissue. When you cut in through that, there's space. So the amount of scarring will be much less. If you have something in stage four, which is dense and frozen, and you cut into that, mm. that's going to be a very different healing response. So even if they need to follow through with something like that, you've now prepared the area to be the best opportunity for healing. And we've seen this because, you know, the, the doctors are, are thrilled 
with what's going on with the ease of doing the surgery and then the ease of getting them to be healed at that point. So yes, we have had people defer from needing it, but there also have been people that have needed it depending. And um, so, so yeah, those are the, the results that we're seeing. That's wild. So if somebody can probably, within their own body, they'll know what stage they might be at. So they're either like, okay, I got nothing really going on, I'm feeling healthy, I'm active, I have a good, uh, like good eating habits, good healthy lifestyle, great. Number two, obviously acute injury. Number three, chronic inflammation. So how does somebody know if they are inflamed chronically? Is that just pain? Pain, pain is basically or some sort of symptom. Some yes, like, like, I mean you can either yes. feel it swelling. I mean it can feel hot because of course now we've got this extra blood flow, but That's it does like get joint pain. Yeah, and it does get to the point where of course you know like there there's less life coming because of the congestion, so it might not be hot. It just might be thick and and really stiff and frozen. But here's the important thing to know about stage two. So we have an injury, and especially with athletes or people that are really active, they don't want to lose their level of activity. So this is where the painkiller stuff gets, you know, to be problematic because the body wants to reset itself back to normal. And pain and inflammation is the way to do that. But people want to be able to play their sport, go walking, golf. Um, you know, if you're told you need to walk 30 minutes a day to maintain your weight and suddenly you've hurt your knee and you're scared, oh my gosh, if I don't walk for two to three weeks, I'm going to put on weight and that can be a psychological thing. So people take the painkiller. Now, you don't have that, that uh, feedback to let you know that, okay, I shouldn't be walking on this right now because I can't walk on it without limping or compensating or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the damage continues even though we don't feel it. So the inflammation continues even though we don't feel it. That's as how then. you to, to stage three. Yeah. And then if you're taking something like an anti-inflammatory, you know, now you're stopping the body's ability to actually rebuild it. Right. So you're... It's like the last thing you want to do. Well, it is the last thing. And it's like you're, you're taking this convenience to override true healing. Because until the body knows it's done with the healing, it's going to continue to inflame. So this is, you know, where it becomes really important to respect this and to take the time to allow the body to go through the process of healing before you go and you, like, we just don't want to mask. We don't want to mask the body's feedback loops because we need to know if there's pain and not to be afraid of it, but to actually um, respect it and, and to be able to do with it what we need to do. And there's many things that we can do with it, but masking it is never going to be a good solution because then you're just not knowing what you should be doing with regard to managing movement, managing how you use your body. Right. So you're mentioning initially we talked about a sprained ankle or a knee or a hip replacement, but other stage three chronic inflammation, you touched on this briefly, can be in the gut, in the breasts, in the neck, in the shoulders, et cetera. So that's where more likely that dis-ease can settle in or other chronic issues where a lot of doctors will say this is pretty well the root cause of all of those major issues, even potentially cancer. So one of the best things that they can just do, and what we saw from the thermography before and after photos, which was incredible, that was a two or three months of this one lady doing block therapy. We had a before and an after of the thermography. Two months, yeah. Two months, which is incredible. But that, that's actually ridiculous how fast those changes really are. In two months of just doing block therapy, nothing crazy, just following our starter package. And there is a significant reduction in inflammation. Didn't change their diet, didn't change their exercise. All they did was fast decompression to allow the body to actually regulate, open up the gates of flow, to pull out the old inflammation, bring in the new, and let the body reset itself. The body's amazing at healing. Like, it's it's brilliant. It knows what it, it wants to do, and it knows what it needs to do. You just need to give it the right tools to allow it and to assist it to go back to the original state. And that's what's very hopeful for everyone. Like from an athlete to somebody who might have a scare to IBS to whatever it is, you can always rid this because if it's just inflammation, I, I love how you really simplify things because when you just view it from the four stages of tissue freeze and how fast we can reverse that, that's just 
it, it settles my mind and probably the listeners as well, because all you have to do is just follow this protocol. And we have a ton of free content on our YouTube. Uh, we have free stuff that you can get on our website to start this practice. And then if you're ready to jump in, you jump in and then you really reap the benefits. Well, and it was really wonderful. Uh, last week I did a webinar with Dr. Eric Gordon. So he's a medical doctor, but he has dove into the world of fashion. So it was really, really fun because we had both sides in. and he said like, you're really viewing the body from the ground up and I'm viewing it from the symptom down. So it was beautiful because one of the questions that came from this webinar was, what about long COVID? You know, why do some people experience issues after they get it and how it settles in and how it seems to take a really long time? And I, I loved his explanation because um, he just put it in his wonderful doctor way, which I'm never, you know, good at doing because I'm not one for detail. But he was basically sharing that when we have areas of chronic inflammation, that's where the body's weak. Mm. So so for someone like that might have had a knee issue, maybe the joint becomes effective and, and, and becomes affected and then it, you know, sticks around for a while. Maybe you have issues with your heart or maybe you have issues with like with with your brain with some inflammation. So maybe you're getting brain fog. So why do some people have issues that last a long time and other people can get rid of things really quickly? It's because of the flow. Right. So it was so lovely for us to kind of go back and forth with this understanding because we were saying the same thing where there's stagnancy when we do get attacked by something. And I mean, there's always viruses coming in and, and, and physically affecting us. If we don't have that flow, that's that weak spot mm -hmm. that that virus is going to be able to go in and manipulate and settle in. And then they create waste and then there's more reason for inflammation. And then, you know, people can get so caught up in like, I don't even know where to start because I've got all of this going on. My body's not working. A lot of people think that their body's actually attacking them. It's really not that. It's really the fact that we have all the stagnancy mm -hmm. and we're cold. So we need to turn on that furnace. And when we can really view it in that simplified way, it takes the fear away because it can be scary. You know, like even, even again, we, we mentioned the language. The language is scary because I mean, unless you're actually a medical doctor had gone for that training. You don't know what's going on. You don't, yeah, like the words are the words are big and long and, and confusing. So to be able to bring it down into something so simple as there's three things, we need to create space, inflate space, maintain space. And we can do that through this process. Then we can take those steps to going from stage four to stage three to stage two, back to stage one. And whether we get all the way back to stage one, as long as we're making progress, and I think that's part of the, the really important thing to understand, too. If you've been unwell for years and that's been your life, the idea of being perfect, as and when I say that, I mean like, you know, you're able to do pretty much whatever you want. That might be a really far stretch, but maybe you don't get there. But maybe you go from being bedridden to now you can actually get up and enjoy a conversation with somebody or now maybe you can actually go for a walk and maybe down the road you can walk up the stairs and then you can play a game of golf like whatever it is we don't have to go from being in stage four to the idea of stage one yeah but it's there as a potential mm -hmm. and as long as we start moving in that direction then we take those steps and each step brings gift so for the person that hasn't been mobile Simply being able to get up and go and make themselves a sandwich is a gift. And I remember years ago, I was working with a quadriplegic who broke his neck at the age of 25. So I was working with this young man for a long time. And I actually asked him the question. I said, you know, what, what is it since your injury that you miss the most? And I mean, he's a 25-year-old guy. I'm thinking you might say, you know, being able to be intimate with someone or being able to play football. And he said, be able to make myself a sandwich. Mm. That's what he missed the most because it's those daily little things that if you can't do them, they truly impact your life. Take it all for granted. We you take don't it all for granted. Take everything for granted unless you are really put into that spot. Similarly, like even just breaking an ankle, like when I was younger. Um, God, I just remember all I want to do is just walk to a buddy's place. I'm like, I don't even want to take my ball. I don't even think I was old enough to try, but I'm like, didn't even want to take my bike. I just wanted to walk there or run. Like I wanted to use it. I wanted to get, like, it was hard to get up to go to the washroom. Well, initially, and then it 
healed very quick. But yeah, it's amazing how much we take everything for granted. So that's very hopeful, everything you mentioned. I, I was thinking of this as we were talking about stage three, which is the chronic inflammation. Do you think that's directly correlated with chronic fatigue? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Because again, if you have inflammation in the brain, I mean, you're going to be tight. If you have inflammation anywhere in the body, you know, we don't have that energy flow. And without that energy flow, we don't have the oxygen getting to the ATP to fuel each cell to do its job. So now we're slugging around. Like, let's say only 30% of our cells are awake to receiving flow. We're literally slugging around 70% of our body weight. It's th those cells aren't actively participating in yeah, our movement. Drive. Yeah. So, I mean, like, let's say like you only have one arm to use. If you're having to carry around 100 pounds of weight with one arm and you can't switch it up and balance things out, it's not going to be very long before that arm gets really fatigued. And I mean, 100 pounds, it won't take long, but even even five pounds, mm -hmm. right? Like carrying something around when you don't have that ability to use both sides of your body, that side becomes overused. So that's really what it comes down to when we're looking at cells and being able to feed them. If we're not feeding them, now they become something that we need to carry instead of them carrying us. Mm -hmm. So this is important for people to understand. If you have chronic inflammation anywhere in the body, it doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly where they need to work. They have to understand that you need to start by activating your breath, your diaphragmatic breath, as you refer to like the furnace, the engine. So whenever Deanna mentions the furnace or the engine, you're referring to the diaphragmatic breath. And then from there, you have to really understand just, and this is why we made it so simple in our starter package, is to understand just the gates of flow. So if you have an ankle injury or something where there's chronic inflammation, you don't just jump to the foot or the ankle. You have to understand we've got to open up the forearm triangle, work our way down because there's adhesions riddled throughout the leg, open that up, and then the flow can make its way to the ankle. Similar to the brain, we don't want to just work immediately on the head. We've got to understand that, well, we're collapsed in the rib cage. We're not using our diaphragm. We probably have rounded shoulders. Our head and our neck are protruding forward. We're blocking off our, our carotid arteries. So we need to unwind that from how we've collapsed. We don't start with the head and the neck and just bring it into proper alignment. We need to initially bring the rib cage out of the core, understand where the shoulders should be by releasing those adhesions, then start releasing adhesions in and around the neck, activating the tongue, because um, the tongue's incredibly important for stabilizing the head and the neck. And then we're actually able to open up those arteries to feed the brain with proper flow. And that's what's going to help pump out that inflammation, then bring in the new, and then start to rebuild the process, essentially. Exactly. And, you know, this is where that third piece, maintaining space, is so crucial to understand. Because even, again, anatomical position. I mean, just turn your palms forward. Look at the difference, what happens through here. As soon as I open my palms, now I've opened the channels for flow. If I'm like this all the time, not only am I compressing the rib cage, now I'm, again, I'm blocking the neck, the flow to the head. So that's why we need to understand how the body's actually supposed to be positioned and how we're supposed to use it. Because as soon as I change it up and I'm all crunched like this, even if I'm sleeping like this, now I'm slowing things down. Yeah. And as soon as those cells aren't receiving the opti optimal amounts, the body is saying, hey, you need more flow. So then, and, and I loved it as Dr. Eric Gordon mentioned that pretty much all of us have low-grade inflammation yeah. because none of us are stage one in perfection. Right. So there's going to be a low-grade inflammation somewhere in all of our bodies and and that's the differentiator. So that's the fun part because now we've taken what we view as normal aging. And I, I love using the word dis-ease instead of disease. To me, disease sounds very permanent. Right. Dis-ease is something that's not at ease and take the dis away and you can bring ease back, right? Right. So, um, you know, playing with words a little bit even, even makes a difference, but we have that opportunity and it's really not hard. It's, it's simply a process. And when I say it's not hard, everybody has their journey. And again, we've got these healing responses that we have to go through as well. And for some people, depending on what they're starting with, how toxic their body is, 
you know, that's all something to consider and to understand what's going to happen. But each healing response we have is a cleaning out of the system. It's a pulling away of the old. So we've created space for the new. So it's reconditioning or it's not reconditioning. It's conditioning people to see the value of pain, to see the value of the healing response, the fever. Because so many people, so almost everyone gets spooked or has a little scare when they're just going through a natural healing response. So it could be a skin rash. It could be, give me some examples. What are the... Well, I'm going through run, one right now, and I have been since February, and it is currently August. With my eye, it was quite fascinating. I was in Mexico with your mom mm -hmm. and my guy, and for some reason, something shifted in my eye. Well, actually, I know why. It was because we started playing with the paddles. So mm -hmm. I started using the paddle in and around my eye, and then I had this piece of skin that had been hooked and stuck underneath my orbit that came out. So now it was like kind of red. It almost looked like a little bit of psoriasis. And it it was like this disintegrated tissue that looked like a, a piece of spinach that was all whatever. So it was here, but it was red. And so it didn't look nice. And I'm like, oh, I mean, like it looked like aged skin, but I was very aware of what happened. So now, okay, something's changing. So now I'm on a mission and I'm on a path to play with it. So this is months later, but what's fascinating is it, it was red up around through here for a long time. And I relate this to when I was 50, so I'm 54 now. At the age of 50, my last wisdom tooth started to come through. Now I have to say that wasn't fun. That was painful. And I have all four wisdom teeth and I'm not getting them taken out, but I, I endured this big, huge mammoth tooth coming through 50-year-old tissue, right? It's not like I'm a baby having like, you know, teething. Right. So this this is coming through. It was a two-year process and there was a lot of pain. And I'm sure I was like, you know, with that pain contracting and compressing. So I think this is what actually created this whole thing with my eye. Hmm. So now, you know, it's it's there and, and whatever, but now I'm working on my eye. So this whole process is changing. So as the skin started to heal up here, it was becoming red around the other parts. And now I'm at, at I feel hopefully the last phase where it's this little piece in here. And what was neat, it was about two weeks ago where the tissue came up here and it looked the same as it did up here at first, where it was, again, that red, dry, flaky, yeah. um, irritated looking tissue. But my vision has improved and I wasn't even aware that it wasn't good. Things are clearer. Mm. So, and that's the thing, like we adapt so much, yeah. right? We're oh, only amazing at doing that. Exactly. And suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing things more crisply. The color is brighter. As all of this stuff is coming out that was pulling my eye and getting sucked in through here. So this is just an example of a healing crisis. But, and I mentioned it on our live community call and I said like, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled with this because mm. as much as it doesn't look good, who cares? I mean, I can tell things are cleaning out and healing. And if my vision's only improving... That's a wonderful thing. But again, healing responses can be skin rashes. They can be change in pain. So as we start putting this energy into the body and we've been locked in a certain alignment, mm. we start shifting. So again, we've mentioned before we create grooves in the fascia. So, you know, if I'm always moving in one way, the groove gets bigger, bigger, bigger. And then I'm just naturally always falling into that pattern of, of movement. Mm -hmm. So as we start with our process, we start changing that. And now we are moving in ways that we probably haven't moved our joints, our body in maybe months, years, or even decades. So as we start going through those edges, we start hitting tissue that hasn't had any flow and we start waking it up. So the first thing that's gonna happen is inflammation. So if suddenly I'm like this and I do a shift to my alignment, now let's say my left knee that hasn't bothered me, it starts hurting and inflaming because now it's taking on a new range of motion. So the body's saying, hey, I've got all these cells that you're actually mm. wanting to integrate. We need to get blood and oxygen in there. So it inflames. So it's this constant process of understanding that inflammation is great. Another uh, woman on our call, on uh, our live community call the other day, she had really severely broken her right tibia just below the knee, had rods put in, screws and all that stuff. And so her left ankle is inflamed. And she was sharing that, you know, at the end of the day, it's inflamed and then she'll use um, a heat pack and whatever. And by morning, it's actually back to normal. And then through the day, it inflames. And mm. she, like, how long will it take? 
And I said, it's going to take as long until the tissue's been rebuilt mm. because that's the whole thing. The body's going to keep sending that blood and oxygen flow until the repair has happened. Mm. So that's what we need to understand. As long as we're doing activity that's beneficial to support inflammation, then we're doing the right things. And that's, again, proper breathing, keeping those gates open and learning how to use your body properly. And those three basic things can change your entire direction of how you age. We will all experience pain. We will all experience feelings of not being well at times, depending on what's going on. But if we view everything, even the cold, as the healing response, because it's something, big. well, it is. If I'm like, my nose is, is like draining or my eyes are watering or I'm coughing or sneezing or I'm getting a fever, that's the body having enough energy to actually push stuff, push stuff out. Yeah. So you don't want to take something to suppress that. You want to allow the body to detoxify and rid whatever's going on because that that's happens. Because yeah. when you put positive energy in, the negative energy needs to leave. And that's where it can present itself in these different forms, as you mentioned. And in this fast paced world where we have so much going on, we don't have time to be unwell. And that's the problem because when your body needs this time to get rid of it, if you give yourself the day or two or three or whatever it needs to reset itself, then you go back to being stage one and you move forward where we don't give ourselves time to allow our body to move that stuff out. So we do take these things. That's the stuff that's going to create the chronic stuff down the road. Mm. So for that little moment of okay. convenience or of not being present for a couple of days because your work is demanding and your kids are demanding, that can be the the thing that, you know, leads you in those directions of sickness later in life. Right. So people who are taking Advil, Tylenol, um, anti-inflammatories almost daily, that's where that will really accumulate and add up. Yeah. And hey, don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. There's times where I have a really bad headache and I'm like, I just got to make it throughout the day. I'll take an Advil once in a blue moon if I just really need to just ease that pain because it's <laughs> so intense. But if you do that too frequently, there's a lot of studies out there that are saying like the effects of Advil. We won't get into that, but. Well, <laughs> actually, I just did a Fashion Master discussion, which will um, people can see on our channel with Sinclair Canale. And we did a deep dive into the liver and mm. what is going on in the liver and chronic complex illness. And one of the things that she mentioned was they're really realizing now how something like Accutane, you know, this, that? It, it was a medicine for acne that teenagers oh, would think gotcha. how that has been or... so impactful in causing liver issues. So basically the chemicals. Um, so again, not only are you minimizing the body's ability to inflame and rebuild, you are now causing all of these chemicals to be stored in your liver, which is going to create more inflammation because now the liver can't process things. And all of these organs are working together to keep us balanced. And if the liver being one of the, well, largest organs. One of the most profound and yeah. many will say the most important organ yeah. to take care of. Absolutely. When it gets backed up and clogged, of course, we're going to be inflamed because there's no ability for the body to clean out those toxins. So the body's in this constant, everything needs assistance. So I'm going to just keep inflaming. <laughs> and that's where a lot of people are at. Okay. So I've, I've done liver cleanses. You and I have a lot of fun with our medical medium stuff and, and it's worked for me. Like I've had, uh, that skin rash only when I was in hot water or if I had a very hot shower, I would get this rash where it looked like a really bad sunburn in that area. And it was a little itchy, but it'd go away within 20, 30 minutes. So what was weird is like, I think what really helped this process was, yeah, I wasn't eating the right foods for my body. So I understood how to detoxify that through following his process. And I took it very, very literally. And I did it to the T essentially. And I did his nine day cleanses and whatnot, which are very intense, but wow, they do definitely help. So I noticed a massive shift and I had this for almost a year and I went to naturopaths and I tried following these new diets and nothing really worked until I committed to his stuff. And that's a big thing that I realized, like you can't take on too many things at once because then you don't really know what's working. 
because if this issue happens again in the future, then you still don't know really what was that little ticket that helped me rid that skin rash. And I know now that almost any issue, again, I'm no doctor, but almost any issue with the skin is primarily caused from the liver. So if my liver is backed up, and what can also cause a backbone of the liver is stress, like which is pretty crazy. Obviously, toxicity and all that crap we're putting into our body. So taking the right foods with a combination of obviously blocking, we block all the time to just improve the flow, then that was the ticket to remove it. I, it was day four, my second time doing the cleanse. I did a month apart and then it was day four and it was gone. And I'm like, this is absolutely incredible. And that's such an empowering feeling. I remember I jumped up and down because I'm like, what's happening to me? Because it wasn't a bad, bad issue. I'm like, okay, my skin's a little red for like 20 minutes after I get into a shower. But it's just the knowing that I had something a little off with my body. It's trying to fight something, but it's just not doing it quite right. And when I was able to get on the other side of that, I haven't had it since. And this was like years ago. I was blown away. I'm like, oh my God, like it's amazing how powerful we are. You just got to give the body what it needs and you got it. It's through trial and error. Like maybe the same cleanses work perfectly for you. Maybe you have to find something different, but that's what worked very well for me. So leading into this question, let's say I didn't change anything um, with my diet and maybe you know cases of those in our community. What can doing block therapy or fascia compression in and around the liver do for the liver if you have a very clogged liver? Great question, Quinn. So I think that's really, you know, again, where that thermography image really speaks to what's happening. So the thing is with the liver, one of the functions is to break down fat. When fat, like butter, is at room temperature, it's a solid, heated up, it becomes a liquid. We need to liquefy things because when there's liquid liquidity, there's flow, right? So if we have all of this congested fat combined with the toxins, we, we talked about how when the snow um, banks melt and they're really dirty, they're the last things to go. So when people have a fatty liver, there's also going to be a lot of toxins in there so it can take some time. So what we need to do is we need to heat it. So the lovely thing is when we're blocking in and around the space of the liver, the diaphragm is right above it. So you're combining this pressure over time with this activity, which if we aren't the diaphragm of the diaphragm moving up and down. So now you're getting this beautiful ability. We're taking this sponge that's dirty and that's frozen and dry, essentially, and we're putting it in water, basically, and we're able to wring it out. That's kind of like what's happening when we're blocking in this space combined with breathing. We're wringing out those toxins, we're heating it up, and then things start to clear out. And then that awakens the liver to being able to do its job. The thing is, if somebody's really toxic and we start wringing that out, you know, the body still has to handle it. Yeah. So that's where people have to gauge how much are you going to do. And for some right. people, they might be able to go full in doing a class. Other people that are really toxic, they've had to slow things down. Yeah. But the thing is, do the work. Even if all you're doing is one position, getting the breath going, or even if you're just lying on your back and you're just activating this muscle, you know, just keep taking those steps forward. Become the conscious breather. That is the most important thing we can do is become that conscious breather. And then as we are able, we can take those steps to release more of the diaphragm, heat more of the core, work through the extremities. And as we've laid out in our program, um, make, we've made it very simple. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh. It's just a fresh, breath of fresh air to hear that uh, because there's so much going on in this world and we have to know how to protect ourselves and to be able to do this on your own time at home, activate your breath, decompress the entire body, allow the body to optimize its flow, rid the waste, bring in the proper nutrients to the cells. The body's remarkable at what it can do. Yeah, really. So I think that's the uh, biggest takeaway and that was really cool. Uh, to break down the four stages of tissue freeze, but also tissue rejuvenation. Yeah. And that's also another big takeaway is your body can heal. It can go back to its original state, or at least you can bring it back to at least to a previous stage. Yeah. And that's the protocol we shared. 
And yeah, if anybody wants more information on this, you can check out our website. Uh, you can check out our YouTube channel at Block Therapy and our awesome Facebook community group. We just hit 10,000 members in our Facebook community group. That's huge. And just type in Facebook Block Therapy Community. And if you just want to join, just request access and then you're in. So that wraps up the episode. Anything else you'd like to share? No, I think we covered lots of stuff yeah, in that one. That was a lot. That was yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you in the next episode.